Good day, listeners. My name is Dr. Ryan Todd, and I'm your host for Beyond the Checkbox. If you are an HR, you are a CEO, you are a VP, and you want more mental health in your organization, this is the podcast for you. Today, we have a very special guest. Needs no introduction, but I will do so anyways. Kelly Rudy, <laughs> uh, an elite goaltender in the league for 15 seasons, played over 677 games, part of one of the longest games in NHL playoff history. And he had an amazing second career, continues to have an amazing second career in broadcast with Hockey Night in Canada, Sportsnet, color commentator for the Calgary Flames. And if that wasn't enough, he has an honorary degree from Mount Royal University for his mental health advocacy. So Kelly, thank you very much for being on the show today. Wow, that's quite the intro, uh, Ryan. Thank you very much. So tell us a little bit about your, your your backstory. You you grew up in Edmonton, yeah. And hockey is everything in Edmonton. It's a religious following, and you kind of meet hockey players that are like, I knew I was going to make the show mm. by the age of mm. ten or fifteen, and and they were going that way. Was that you, or were you along no. for the ride? Where where did you land? All right, so uh, long. This will be a long winded answer, but so I was growing up, and I just loved every sport. And my brother and I, uh, we played everything. My brother's uh, five years older than I am. And uh, so we grew up in the west end of the city and all of our friends would play uh, street hockey in the winter, ball hockey in the summer, baseball, football, every sport you can imagine. All the racket sports, we liked tennis, uh, we liked racquetball back then, morphed into squash, all these things. And I had no inkling whatsoever I was going to be a hockey player. I didn't even start playing organized hockey till I was 12. Really? And uh, the reason I wanted to uh, play organized hockey simply because I wanted to be around my friends more often. So when I was 11, I asked my mom and dad if I could join a team. And uh, they didn't even hesitate. This was the best advice ever. They said, no, you have to <laughs> learn how to skate for a year. And you, as you can imagine, Edmonton back in the... Uh, 60s, uh, early 70s, it was a little bit colder, and so there were plenty of opportunities, outdoor rinks, and yeah. so I'd go every single day, of course, after my homework, and I'd go out to the outdoor rink and uh, skate and play chinny with all my buddies and so on, so then, then the next year when I was 12, I started playing on a team, but the fact of the matter is, growing up, Ryan, we didn't have very much money. My mom and dad worked really hard, but we didn't have a lot of extra cash. And so, but they gave me and my brother the greatest gift in the world. Um, we would go camping in the summer. That was our holiday. And we'd go to Banff, Jasper, Lake Louise, those areas. Yeah. And I fell in love with that area of the world. Um, to this day, it's still my favorite place to travel to. But I wanted to be a park warden. My goal in life was to be a park warden in Banff or Jasper, Yoho, something like that. And this stupid game of hockey got in the way because <laughs> I started to get a little bit better. But not until I was about 16 or 17 did I really start to improve wow. a little bit. And it wasn't until I was 18 and I'd, uh, or maybe even 19 when I was drafted, that I kind of had an idea, you know what, I think I can make some money in this. I, I had no idea before that. More money than you would have as a park warden, maybe, oh, give, maybe. Or take, <laughs> give or take a couple dollars. That would have been a cool job. That, yeah, that, yeah. And I wonder if that could happen today. Like, that's such a cool story, right? That you started playing organized hockey when you were 12. Yeah. And now you, you're, if you're six, you're getting a late start. Right. And, and if you're not playing summer hockey, and yeah. if you don't you're not going all, in the all camps. these camps, right? Yeah. And I don't know if there's a right or wrong answer. Uh, I think you could probably tell where how I'm leaning that I don't think you need all those camps and I don't think you need to play year round yeah but having said that <clears throat> I do appreciate that every sport's going to that it's not just hockey I've talked to other people and in particular I've talked to agents that to handle other athletes and they're saying their sports have gone the same way so that unfortunately it's hard to <clears throat> play other sports you've got to pick or choose a sport at some yeah. particular age and then just go into it full time which isn't great, but that's just how it works. Yeah, I think the travesty is uh, like, you know, growing up rural Saskatchewan, you played every sport, mm -hmm. right? Like baseball, summers, football, huge in the there, fall. Right? 
Yeah, baseball is is definitely the, the second biggest sport. Yeah. Um, and then there's a, a pretty short football season because right. it gets cold right, right. right away. <laughs> and then hockey is like a 10 month season in Saskatchewan. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you played every sport and, yeah. and you kind of you figure out what you like and yeah. and uh, there's a ton of team camaraderie because That's you actually right. play with the same folks. Yeah. From like the age of five yeah. to you know grade 12. Yeah. And and you're. Yeah. Uh, you're learning different skills too. For instance, it was important that I brought up that I played a lot of racket sports because, yeah. you know, uh, playing tennis uh, at a young age, I don't know what age I started, but my buddies and I, my brother, we'd all go to the tennis courts and you learn hand eye coordination, little things, like not just hitting the ball as hard as you can, yeah. but at the net. Yeah. And then I played a lot of badminton as a kid and, uh, uh, like I said, started to play some racquetball, and then it changed into squash, which, by the way, uh, I'm on record saying many times, I think squash is the best game ever invented. And I used to play five, six times a week, singles and doubles, and then yeah. I wrecked my knee, and now I'm not able to play anymore. But I miss it because it was such a great game and I love it, yeah. competitive. Wow. Yeah, and it's uh, it's just mono a mono. Yeah, That's what right. You're in the cage <laughs> too, know. right? It's great. And, and you yeah. know, it's funny you, you say that, and and uh, intimidation's a part of sports sure. like that, right? <laughs> like you're staring the guy down, yeah. or you're you're being a jerk in some different yeah, way, totally. and, right? You're just yeah. trying to get an advantage. When I play with my brother, I'll take a couple off the back every game. Oh, totally, yeah. right. <laughs> and, it's, and he, he seems to be, uh, yeah, none the wiser to it. He just puts mm -hmm. his hands up mm -hmm. like, what is it? I, I, you're in the well, way. Well, you're it's in the my way. my fault, right? I'm the That's younger right. brother. That's right, you're in the way. Yeah. So did you know you were, um, this is kind of a silly question, but when did you know, like, oh, I'm athletic? Oh, I've never really thought of this answer, but I, I, I suppose – if it didn't really click in, I should have uh, my last year in elementary school because yeah. I won the award for the best athlete in the school. Yeah. So um, Clint Malarchuk wrote about that in his book a few years ago, and it never really occurred to me. I was very proud of that trophy, yeah. by the way. Yeah. But, um, but you know, in elementary, you win something. Do, <laughs> do you re right? <laughs> Everybody wins something. Do you know that you're actually yeah. pretty good, or yeah. is that just – you stood out to one teacher. I, I, didn't, yeah. I don't know. I didn't know. The, the, I find it interesting, the trajectory of young players today, because there's a subtle messaging that happens. I work with a lot of younger mm -hmm. athletes. There's a subtle messaging happens kind of at each step of the way that, like, you're a little bit better. You're a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, what I love about the game of hockey is you see a lot of young players who really invest in humility. Okay. But if, if you don't do that and you're continually given this message, you're good, you're right. better than. Right. You, you feel better and you think you're better than everyone else. So you kind of I, I, I see a lot of young athletes give up the academic stuff, hmm. um, give up some of the relationships that they otherwise wouldn't have had. Hmm. And you lose that balance. And I right. think that's happening more today because – we're diverging like so young like you're right. you're a hockey player by the age of seven right and you're in the double a camps and yeah you're you're, you're tra on the traveling squad and that just never used to happen yeah no it didn't when i was around now i'm soon to be 60 um they there weren't camps like that there's yeah. there's no opportunity for those sorts of things it is interesting though how you mentioned like you're giving up things and it's not healthy if you're not doing the work you need to in school but you certainly do lose some relationships or friendships because <clears throat> to do anything properly, you've got to really invest time. Sure. And uh, if you don't, you won't get ahead. It's so yeah. you, you have to be very committed. Whether it's that's a fault, it could be, but I think it's it's a natural thing that if you are going to be um, really good at something, you, you've got to really focus all your time and effort into that. Yeah, and you have kids, and uh, so mm -hmm. you've, as, as a parent, you've obviously tried to instill that in them, right? That they mm -hmm. should be committing to something and working hard toward a goal. Yeah. And I, str I struggle with that. My, my kids are quite young, but yeah. when, they, when they get older, like, do you want them to be more balanced or focused? Because mm -hmm. we always talk about right. balance versus focus, and, and I don't know how to, I mean, you want them to be happy and successful and all yes. those damn things, but how do you do it all as yeah, a parent? Yeah, there's no right or wrong answer. There's yeah. no perfect formula. All I know is that uh, for us, we've found a really good balance. And what I'm really, what I really look forward to, Sundays. I travel home Sundays most often, and uh, we always have a big family dinner. And everybody's there: our three daughters, our son-in-law, our grandson, our 
uh, the two fiancés that we have, and it's just a, it's a beautiful mix of everybody coming together, and it's the one day we try really, really hard, all of us, to get together and spend a few hours, so <clears throat> you can't beat that. Right? Yeah. You, that, that time and best, that's, that's the best. Your whole family's in Calgary? Right now. Nice. <laughs> that's about to change? <laughs> no, I don't think so, but yeah. I, I said that because we've had times where everybody's been away, <laughs> yeah. and we've been yeah. empty nesters a couple times. Now yeah. we're back to empty nesters, and I think it's going to stay that way. Yeah. Okay. You don't mind today? Eh? Do like, uh, I'm at home alone for this week because my wife's traveling. Right. Man, it's weird. Like, I it's, know. It's very quiet. And <laughs> I, I know. When, <laughs> when nice. we first, when everybody first moved out, it was, my wife and I, I remember uh, looking at each other, uh, where we, our family room, she sits over here and I'm in my favorite chair across <laughs> the room. Our TV's over here. We're kind of looking at, her, at each other like, is this what it is? Like, yeah, what do we do now? <laughs> right? yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was uh, interesting, but we've settled into it nicely now. That's great. No, I'm yeah. glad all the family's around. I, yeah. I mean, let's talk a little bit about parenting because uh, there's no easy answers. No. And you have three daughters, is that yes. right? And uh, they're all they're all adults now, yeah. and and uh, you've shepherded them through the process, and and you've been you know been very open about uh, your daughter's struggles yeah. with OCD. Yeah. Um, if you don't mind, tell us a little yeah. bit about, you know, that journey and, and how that's been as a parent. Oh, it was a uh, mighty struggle. Still is. Still can be. Yeah. Uh, you worry every day. Every parent will tell you the same. Yeah. Uh, my wife and I used to laugh. <clears throat> Why are our parents so worried about us? You know, we're uh, in our 40s and yeah. <clears throat> now we're getting it. Now yeah. we understand. Um, but Caitlin, she's our youngest. She's now 27 years old. But when she was about 11 years old, all of us see it a little bit differently. Uh, Donna thinks she was more like 12 years old. Kate kind of thinks she was around 12. But yeah. my recollection is that she was around 11 years old, and she, was <clears throat> she had all these peculiar habits. That's what we were calling them. So she had these things. Uh, I don't know if you can see on the camera, but she'd go like this. She was always blinking her eyes randomly. Yeah. And, but not just three, four, five times. It was just like all day long, it seemed. So that was one. <clears throat> and then she started big off uh, sleepovers. Uh, she loved dance, didn't want to go to dance mm. class. She had all these things. Um, and <clears throat> it was really interrupting her life. Then finally, for first, gra or first day of grade seven, uh, Donna was taking her to school and Caitlin <clears throat> literally could not get out of the car. She was so terrified. Wow. Yeah. So if you were to ask Donna, she'd say, if only you could see the sheer look of fear on her face. Um, <clears throat> so they drove home and Donna opened the phone book because it was so long ago. <laughs> Nobody has a phone book anymore. But uh, that was the uh, fall of 2004, I believe. And luckily for Donna, the first uh, name she found in the phone book was a psychologist by the name of uh, Dr. Kelly Moraz. I'm not sure if you're, you're familiar with Kelly here in the city. And uh, the receptionist said, yeah, I can get you in in about three months. And Donna said, please, you don't understand what's going on. And she, she said, hang on a minute. <clears throat> and said, can you be here in 15 minutes? And so they made their way down to the doctor's office and in 15 minutes and it changed her life like you know it took a lot of years and a lot of work and still is a lot of work for Caitlin but um, I remember when she was 16 years old we we're having a conversation about it and she said yeah it's starting to get better I'm starting to have more good days than bad yeah and that was quite an eye-opener <clears throat> excuse me for us as parents thinking holy we've been doing this for four years and you're now only having more good days than bad and so that's a, it's a battle, but it's the greatest work we've ever done as a family. So she was diagnosed mm -hmm. shortly after going to see Kelly with OCD and uh, anxiety. Um, and so we've learned so much about mental health and the battle our families had with it, battle other families have had. <clears throat> I think, Ryan, one of the greatest things that uh, uh, I, they want to, best feelings I have is when I go into my local coffee shop every day and people come up to me because they know how open we are and they share their stories. Yeah. Right? It's crazy how I think everybody goes through something. Yeah. Some in some different way. Yeah. Maybe it's not completely debilitating like it was for Caitlin, but it, it affects 
everybody. I, I, I'm, this is, again, long-winded, but the Canadian Mental Health Association will tell you that one in five Canadians uh, are affected. I say maybe it's not debilitating, <clears throat> but I say four in five or five in five yeah. have something. I know I do. And sure. I, I didn't know that until dealing with Caitlin and going through all the, the different uh, programs and therapies and so on. And I'm, I'm okay sharing that too. No problem. What did you recognize in yourself when you saw what Caitlin was going through? Well, I didn't even recognize it until my family started noticing things I was doing. Yeah. So <clears throat> I've never been uh, uh, clinically diagnosed, but clearly I have OCD. And a great example of it, but it doesn't affect my day-to-day -day where I, if I can't do this, it's okay. I can still get by. As an example, I travel on the road so often. <clears throat> First thing I typically do when I get to my hotel room, I lay out a washcloth and I take out all my toiletries and I set them there in, a, in the same pattern yeah. every single time. Now, <clears throat> if I don't, yeah. it's okay. It doesn't stress yeah, me. Yeah, okay. But it, yeah. it, it is pretty important to me that yeah. I do that. And other yeah. things. And so my kids laugh at me. Donna laughs at me. And I have other things that I like to do. But, again, that's how I think everybody's affected in some way. But it, I, I can still get through the day without any problems. Yeah. But it's certainly an issue. Goalies are known to be, you may have heard this, <laughs> okay. a little bit quirky. <laughs> Okay. And uh, did you notice anything in your playing career that you like, uh, like George St. Pierre openly talked hmm. about how his OCD uh, was at times debilitating, but at times put him on such a wildly strict training regimen. Right. And he felt that he at times benefited from it. Yeah. And then, and then he came out and said that he, he couldn't uh, fight one year because it was so severe. Hmm. Um, did you notice anything in your playing career uh, that like, call it quirks, call it routine, call it, I mean, all hockey players sure. have routine, but things yeah. that were, I guess, obsessive. Uh, <clears throat> the answer is no, I don't think I did. Yeah. I don't think I had any particular quirky habits or I don't think, <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, uh, if you were sitting across the dressing room from me, I don't think you'd look at me and go, watch this guy. Like he's next thing he's going to do is this or this or this. Yeah. That wouldn't have been the case, <clears throat> but I know you have my book here. Uh, I had an episode in uh, Milwaukee 1992-93 season where my thoughts were <clears throat> getting the best of me. So it was crazy. I don't know what happened. I don't know what triggered it, if there was a trigger, or if that's just where my brain was going. But yeah. in the summer leading up to that season, I had all these negative thoughts that I think it was, I was entering my 10th year. in the What sorts of things? Um, I can't do it anymore. Can you keep playing? Or you, you can't stay at this level any longer. My brain was, Caitlin taught me this about the loop, and the loop was going uh -huh. round and round and round, and it was all giving me negative thoughts. You hear <coughs> that so often with OCD patients, the loop. Right. And, uh, and you're trying to break out of that loop. It's, it's, oh. it's in traffic. Well, I, yeah. had, no, I yeah. had no help either. Yeah. I didn't know anything. I didn't know about the loop. I didn't know why my brain was telling me all these negative things. And then finally I came crashing down in Milwaukee and I was able, oddly enough, <clears throat> the next day we played, uh, it was one of those neutral site games. Yeah. I had one of my best games of my career. And uh, uh, we won the game against Chicago. I had 40 some saves. We flew home and we had a bit of a homestand and the thoughts grew even louder. And <clears throat> I just couldn't, I, I just couldn't shut them off. Yeah. Had no tools to do that, and I went in a ditch in a hurry, and I was in that ditch for almost two months. Luckily for me, my coach, Barry Melrose, recognized... What did he see? Uh, pardon me? What did he see, Barry Melrose? Like, what, was it <coughs> how you're a, performing? Or yes, like, and a guy that uh, yeah. I suppose uh, that I would have looked really troubled, because I cared a lot about yeah. how I played, and I cared a sure. lot about my team and, yeah. and the results not only my results, but the team's results. And I suspect he knew that I was in a troubled place. And luckily for me, after about a month, maybe a month and a half, he he helped me get help. So he introduced me to Tony Robbins. And uh, I met uh, personally with Tony a few times. But my first meeting with, wow. yeah, it was, it changed my life. What was that like meeting with Tony? Was he... <clears throat> 
When was this? Was he the... It the, was January the, of 1993. So was he the star? I mean, he was yes, probably getting it, there. But. Yeah. He was... Well, I knew of Tony from the infomercials, right? Okay. Anthony yeah. Robbins, and he had the books out. He had the tapes that yeah. you could buy and so on. And so it was a Saturday afternoon. I'm going to say, if my memory serves me well, January 17th. It's a Saturday. We're playing at home, an afternoon game. I'm not playing, but I am backing up. Rob Stauber is going to play. I'm in my usual spot in my dressing room stall around noonish, drinking my coffee, taping my sticks, the, sort of the routine I had. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Barry walks in, and right behind him is Tony Robbins, and... Uh, which wasn't unusual because I'm playing on a team with Wayne Gretzky. We had all sorts of stars. Wasn't in. unusual for Tony Robbins to walk in the dressing room or anybody, any big star. It was before games, after games. It was, it was the norm, really. And that's <coughs> wild. Yeah, it was crazy. It was oh, a hey, crazy Tony life. Robbins, yeah. what's happening? Yeah, welcome. And so <laughs> they walk in, and uh, seconds later, Barry opens his the coach's uh, door, says, "Kelly, can I see you?" And this is how negative my thoughts were, Ryan. I'm thinking, hmm, that's odd. Why would Tony Robbins want to meet the lousiest goalie in the league? That's what I thought of myself. It's incredible <laughs> that you remember that thought. Oh, like yeah. it was so strong, mm -hmm. so poignant that you can remember exactly what that oh, thought was. Oh, yeah. When you first saw Tony Robbins, that went through your head. Yeah. Not like, holy shit, that's Tony Robbins. Right? No, yeah. I didn't think that. I thought, I was actually kind of worried because I knew what Tony did. I knew what... I think was going to happen. <clears throat> and so we go in there and Barry introduces us and says he's worked with Tony for a while. And, and uh, it's it very much like this. That's Barry Melrose sitting in his chair. Yeah. I'm sitting in a chair like this. And Tony Robbins is sitting in a chair over here. Yeah. And uh, he says, Barry says, Kelly, are you interested in working with Tony? I, I, I'm hoping we can get you out of this. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh. 1993, first of all, I don't think there are sports psychologists around back then. Yeah. And if they were, I don't, they might most likely didn't have an idea what they were doing either because sure. we didn't know yet. Yeah. <clears throat> and so uh, I said, of course. And I'm thinking, how oh, awesome. My coach is reaching out to me. Most coaches, I think, back then would have said, oh, let's get rid of this guy yeah, as you're fast done. as yeah. possible. Yeah. You know? and, uh, he, but he, Barry asked, do you mind if I sit in? And I thought, no. Of course not. You can sit in. I mean, you're you're going way out on a limb yourself. And <clears throat> I'd love to work with Tony. I don't like this feeling, by yeah. the way. Yeah. And so uh, I turn my chair around this way. <clears throat> Tony's here. He stands up. And if you're not familiar with Tony, he's six foot he's nine. He's huge. Huge. Yeah. Yeah. And so I had an idea what was happening. So he stood the entire time. So he wanted to get that advantage over me right away. <laughs> and and then the greatest thing sort of happened because Tony <laughs> spoke like an athlete. Yeah. So he's swearing and he's, and I'm thinking, oh, okay, this, he feels like a teammate of mine. Yeah. And so we went through the session, not sure, I can't remember how long it lasted, half hour, 45 minutes, sure. and I was able to work with Tony again. But the greatest takeaway was that he, he taught me to break the loop. I d still, I didn't know about the loop, yeah. but he got yeah. me to change my thought process. And so... Uh, I had played, I got out of the ditch. We ended up going to the Stanley Cup finals that, that year. And I think in large part is because of the work that Tony did with me, Barry. Wow. Yeah. Um, my teammates saw the change in me, the, how I became strong again, <clears throat> uh, became a general. Um, but I, I had this index card and I laminated it. And there were four thoughts in there. And I looked at uh, that card every single time I went on the ice. So before warm-up, before the first period, before the yeah. second period, before the third period, and if there's overtime <clears throat> in a playoff game, I'd look at that card. And the first two th thoughts were about mental health, what I needed to do. The first one was uh, Schwarzkopf. So uh, the Gulf War, I think, was just ending or ha had ended. Yeah. <clears throat> and I loved General Norman Schwarzkopf. I loved yeah. his power. I, yeah. I, you know, he was strong. He'd get in front of the cameras every day and he'd chin up and look he looked like a general right yeah <clears throat> and then the second one was uh this picture in picture thing i needed to work on and then two were technical things about hockey but that index card i still have it and uh it it changed my hockey world for sure 
That was at a time, that was 93 yes. against Montreal. Yes. And, and that was a time when, uh, I mean, goalies were facing a lot of shots in that oh, day, totally, too. Right? The gear wasn't the same. Right. Uh, <clears throat> so the, the, the goalie was such a relied upon position. Yeah. I think more so, I don't know, you could argue more so than now. Like, I had read a stat about um, that at one time you had faced the most penalty shots. Yeah. That was, you were holding the record yeah. for yeah. getting the most penalty shots. And it was just a wild number in a season. Right? Yeah, it was yeah. like, and... Uh, Twelve in my career. And, and, and so potentially the, you know, the, the defense at the time on your team, coming from the Islanders, uh, yeah. pretty structured team to <laughs> yes. L.A., which is a little bit more... Uh, Run and gun. Oh, yeah. Uh, it was you know, fun, though. You're, I'm sure it was, it was a blast, <laughs> you know. And so it's really cool to hear the how that sports psychology, that mental health piece, because it was such a, a crux position, right. changed, you know, the, the season around for you. Uh, you know, what was interesting, the next year, our, our team was slumping. And so um, Barry, again, he involved Tony Robbins, but not with me, our team. Yeah. And so we had a team session with Barry, and, and it was, it went well. Like, we turned it around for a little bit, but I could see there was a lot of guys that were really hesitant about participating in yeah. the, these exercises. They're clearly not buying into the mental wellness of, <laughs> of an athlete. Yeah. But uh, it was, so Barry wanted, or Tony wanted me to go through that first day I met him. I shared some really personal thoughts, and uh, he asked me to share them in front of the guys. I told him, I told the guys the positive part, but I wouldn't share the negative. I said, you can share the story, yeah. but I didn't like it. I didn't like being there, and I'm not going down that road again. Yeah. So I didn't want to have those feelings again. Yeah. It was very powerful for me. I, I don't know if it, I can't share what my teammates were thinking, but for me, yeah. it, for me, a year later or so, and recognize the strength that I had uh gathered was it was empowering to me you said you were a general again yes which i was is a cool yeah. metaphor yeah, yeah i i use that word a lot yeah yeah because it, that's an important word for me because i've always said um didn't matter if it was pavel Bure or even when i played against wayne or whomever when i was playing well i was in charge i was the guy that was in charge not yeah not those guys and I still feel like that sometimes uh, um, when I'm broadcasting. I, I've got to get into a good mind space where I really believe in myself. It's, it's, it's the oddest thing. You know, I've been broadcasting for 21 years, and some days you, you're, you're not as sharp as you need to be, and you have some doubts. And I've got some really good people that I work with, and, and uh, they'll say things like confidence. Be confident and believe in yourself. And it's a crazy thing when you're – my age <laughs> you're you're still thinking going to work that yeah. you've got to believe in yourself but it's it's kind of it's great to hear i think for our listeners too that like and this may sound wild to you but uh kelly rudy needs to tell himself yeah. to be confident yeah like like when you were playing with the kings like you were the rock star you know you're you're traveling around with greta everywhere yeah. and yeah. and uh, with all the movie stars <laughs> and it was just it was just uh you brought hockey to california right with gretzky and it was and um, and for you to say I needed confidence and I needed a boost, I need to do visualization. Yeah. I think that's really powerful. And another word I'll bring into it: uh, nervousness. So I'm still nervous for every broadcast. Like today's podcast. Uh, you know what? <laughs> it, it, honestly, I thought about it a ton yesterday. Oh, great! I thought about <laughs> it a lot last night getting ready. Uh, I didn't sleep well today. Or last night because I sorry to do that. To you, no, man. that's how my <laughs> that's how my brain works. But you know, I go back to my playing days. I played with Wayne for eight years in L.A. and I bet it would have been in the seventh year together. Yeah. And we're playing somebody at home, <clears throat> and we usually get dressed about twenty minutes, thirty minutes before warm up. Wayne had his regular routine. I remember him walking sort of to his stall. His stall was about three or four stalls to my left. And nobody happened to be sitting there at the time. And I said, hey, you still get nervous for games? And he looked at me and goes, oh, I'm nervous for every game. And I'm thinking, holy, Wayne Gretzky's nervous for every game? Like, he had a way, I guess, of hiding it, or we all did, I suppose. Sure. Uh, like, you'd look around at dressing room in the National Hockey League, and I don't think you'd 
sense nervousness, but there's a, there's a ton of it. It's a, but it's a good nervousness. It's nervous uh, energy, nervous anticipation. I like that feeling. Yeah. We try and, uh, when we're working with, you know, uh, companies and people under stress, we try and profess to like turn that nervousness into added energy. Yes. And, Perfect. and, and, and it, it's a nice tool because we actually feel so uncomfortable with that nervousness. Yeah. And if it just turns internal, it can really yeah. damage your, your performance. I think, you know, Ryan, uh, my favorite coach was Al Arbor. Uh, yeah. he was like a second father to me, just a wonderful guy. He could still be really tough on you. And he was, he was stern for sure. But he had this, he had, these ideas about mental health. He talked a lot about, I, I don't know if any of us use those words or anything, but he talked about that nervousness that I was just talking about and that feeling you get in your stomach. Yeah. And he tried to explain it, but he, you know, he, he didn't have the tools to explain how to change that into the energy you're talking about. But he said, you've got to figure out how to make that feeling into bring in, into energy. And it was really cool because he said everybody's different and I can't tell you how to do it. I don't, can't tell you the process, but you can do it and it, you can use that or make that feeling into something positive. And so I was able to do it. I don't know how, but I was able to, you know, I'd sit in my stall and I was always nervous for warm up. But the worst part, Ryan, was that those 10 minutes or so after warm up before you'd walk out sure. to the ice for the game. That yeah. was a, Oh my gosh, that was the worst 10 minutes. And uh, then the first three minutes of a game, you're super nervous, you still have that feeling in your stomach. And then all of a sudden it goes away yeah. and you feel great. Most of the time that has to take a toll. We talked a little bit about the travel, like the travel that you mm -hmm. do and how exhausting that is. Like anxiety is, is exhausting. Yeah. And so that has to take a toll. And I think like when players talk about pressure, Mm -hmm. like playing in markets like Montreal, Calgary, yes. Toronto, Those and the media. Tough. Like I think that what I think and my theory is with all my uh, amazing athletic experience, of course, <laughs> is that 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 pressure, you know, that anxiety that you feel 10 minutes before yeah. the game, if you're in Toronto, because everything just feels and is yeah. portrayed as more important, yeah. you know, that that feeling is 10 times or it's prolonged and that's exhausting. And I oh, think totally. you can kind of see it in these markets where like nearing the end of the season, they're getting mentally exhausted. Yeah. And some of the best coaches, I think uh, like shelter yeah. their players from that, like with the Chicago Cubs, was it Joe Madden, Joe Madden, Joe? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. We're, this is not a baseball <laughs> thing. Uh, Joe Madden, he was able to shelter his players and yeah. in, in for the Cubs. Cause I think the Cubs deal with the same thing, right? Baseball is just yeah. everything. 100%. And uh, if you can, a good coach, I think, does that. Tries to shelter them from the new, the news and the noise and the and the pressure, so you don't get mentally exhausted. Oh, oh, I agree, and I've often wondered that because I played my entire career in the states, and for the most part, you, you're not ever recognized anywhere away from the rink. And I always wondered what it w would have been like to have played in a Canadian market. And I see it now in my broadcasting when I see the guys out in the city or whatever, and I, I wonder. Could I have handled that? I don't know. I'll never know that answer. It's in particular, because they're young. So how do you handle things when you're in your 20s? Mm -hmm. uh, that's, a, that's a young age to have this sort of um, all the eyes on you. I have no idea how it affects them. But I, I suppose it's good if you're playing well. And I yeah. can't see how it would be great if, if you're not. Who is the defenseman on the Ducks? They won the cup. Boschman. Yeah, and then uh, yeah, and then the lease brought him in, and he was terrible there. Yeah. He couldn't deal with the the media, the pressure in Toronto. He goes back to Anaheim, and he's a good defenseman again. Yeah. So yeah. he's one of many guys you'd look at, and you go the stress and pressure of playing in particular markets must be tough. Having said that, we kind of did experience that in L.A. I was going to say yeah, with yeah. Wayne. Right? It was the most, you know, in your book, uh, there's a quote. It was the most famous hockey team right. ever. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, there's the movie stars and all the attention. You were mm -hmm. kind of responsible. You're brought, bringing the game to the the shining bright light. So there had to have been a pressure there. Oh, tons. And I felt it definitely. So did my teammates. I mean, one of the things that we discuss often is that, for instance, just pick a mark. We're, we're the L.A. Kings. We're on the road. We're going somewhere. 
and it might be January, which those are hard games to play anyways, kind of the dog days of the year. And, you know, your wife calls you, two of your kids have the flu, she's not having a great time with this, you're feeling a little under the weather, you look at your buddy, he's got a cold, you look at another guy and he's got a bad knee or whatever, and everybody's struggling with something. And we'd be like, but hey, we're here, Wayne's here, and people have paid top dollar in this market to see Wayne Gretzky. We're not letting our teammate down. And so we felt pressure wow. at home and we felt pressure on the road because everybody paid their hard-earned money to go see Wayne. Yeah. And how dare we let our buddy down? We, we could not go into a market and say, oh, this is a tough game. And, you know, if we lose 6-2, no big deal. Yeah, it's a big deal. Wayne had a lot of pride about uh, his performance and the team's performance. Was there an element of like, like it, it felt like, and when you read about that time, like Wayne was felt responsible for bringing oh, yeah. hockey to the South. Like it was yeah. one of the things that he wanted to do. And I imagine, you know, you were, you were a part and parcel of that. You had the, you're rocking the blue bandana <laughs> and um, that thing was awesome. I heard, just sidebar. I heard a rumor that you like just ripped one of those greasy blue hockey shirts, and it was yeah. one of those things. Yeah, when I was in uh, <laughs> New York, because I just I had longer hair, I wore contacts, and I was just trying to find something that was more absorbent than yeah. a regular headband. And I yeah. finally the underwear, the T-shirt we used to wear under our gear, I yeah. ripped it up and used it one day in practice. I was like, hey, yeah. I, I didn't recognize it was going to become a trademark of mine, <laughs> <laughs> so to speak. But um, you know, it was interesting when I got to LA. I was, first of all, I was really mad I got traded because I wanted yeah. to play for the Islanders forever. I, I, all of us were hoping to play for one team, win Stanley Cups, and like Steve Eisman had the good fortune of playing for Detroit. And the Islanders were just coming off a run. They at were. That time. Great yeah. run. And so I get traded to L.A., and I didn't know much about L.A. and the hockey market. And it was interesting because when I got traded there, if I'm not mistaken, there were only two rinks in around the Los Angeles area. There was a great Western Forum where we played, and there's this place called the Culver City Ice Rink. That's where we practice most often. Like those were the only two yes. rinks. And wow. the Culver City Ice Rink was terrible. Like it was really run down. I am not exaggerating. The ice was uneven, like there'd be bumps. <laughs> it was it was maybe the worst sheet of ice I've ever yeah. skated on. Yeah. But then you fast forward, what, that was in 1989. You look at today, and I did some research, oh, about – three years ago, and there were a couple rinks in San Diego that I know. I believe there's close to 60-some ice surfaces now wow. in, in around Cal Southern wow. California, something like that. It could be more now. And I'm thinking that is, in my opinion, I'm a little bit biased, but that is purely because of Wayne Gretzky and the impact Well, give yourself had. a lot of credit, man. Come well, on. and all of our teammates. We sure. did a lot of good work in yeah. the community trying to grow the game, but it was purely Wayne Gretzky and Bruce McNall, our owner, that brought uh, Bruce, or Wayne there and I think man um, the the work that Wayne did and because he's such a easy guy to like that it, it transformed the game of hockey you look at California you can easily make the case that California is a hockey hotbed now for yeah. junior hockey in, in western Canada in particular and I know like I used to be a part of the Nanaimo Clippers ownership group and we had a lot of kids come from California and they were yeah. good yeah, really good. So I just think of the the impact Wayne had on the game is uh, I don't know if today's players truly recognize the impact he had on the game itself. Did, did you and he ever talk about the that mental side, the pressure side of, you know, bringing the game? You're there the traveling road show like you mm -hmm. go to. Uh, I mean, you go to Dallas and there's a full barn there because of you guys. Yeah. And uh, like you mentioned the pressure. Did you and. Did you and Wayne ever talk about that? We didn't. It's uh, just probably we just I mean, felt it. Yeah, yeah, felt the pressure. Um, I would think guys in their twenties, nineties, most likely weren't sharing a lot of thoughts about th these experiences and how the impact uh, that they might have on us yeah. and and so on. I could just see with Wayne that, like, <clears throat> Wayne grew up with all that pressure his entire life, basically. And so he somehow managed it. I don't know how, but uh, I never saw him really get 
flustered. He, he shared something really uh, interesting with us. It happened to be that same year, 92-93. Uh, yeah. He was coming off that really serious back injury that people thought it might be the end of his career, in fact. And uh, we had a meeting with Barry Melrose, and Barry was talking to all of us and asking, it was after a bad loss at home, and asking us questions about why we're performing so poorly or what we're going through. And Wayne stood up and said, hold it, like, stop it. This, this, basically, this is nonsense. I'm lousy. I couldn't believe he said it. I'm lousy. I, like, I'm the worst guy on the team right now, and that's going to change tomorrow. So I'm going to come to practice tomorrow morning, and I'm going to be the best player on the ice. And he said to all of us, and so will you guys, and we're going to get out of this. And we did. Like, it was like that. He, he convinced all of us um, that he needed to be better, and we needed to be better and just follow him. And it was, it was really cool to kind of see. I, I personally, up until he said that, I had no idea he, he thought that of himself. I thought he... He knew he was Wayne Gretzky. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you know? <laughs> right? How can you lose yeah. confidence? <laughs> and you've, you've played with some incredible players. Yeah, like I did. Mike Bossy and yeah. Paul Coffey, Ari Curry. and Dennis Potman, Mike Bossy, Brian Trache, Billy Smith. Did endless. I mean, and they all had their you know, their leadership qualities about them. I'm sure. I'm sure the Gretter was was a leader amongst leaders. Eh? Yeah. So it was funny. So I'm thinking about all the great players I played with and I played on the 87 Canada Cup team and so the the finals best two out of three and we're playing uh, against the Soviets um still a communist country back then hard Wild. to imagine right that was and crazy. <clears throat> so game two's going overtime Grant Fuhrer's the goalie I'm the backup that night and uh, going into double overtime and we're leaving the bench and Wayne grabs my arm and he goes I want you to talk to the guys about uh, playing long overtimes because that sp- Easter uh, epic. Yes, yeah, of course. Just played in the spring in the Easter epic, which went to four overtimes. And I'm thinking, seriously, <laughs> I'm going to go into that dressing room and talk about <laughs> playing a long game. And now you have to prepare. And I'm looking around. And there's Everyone Wayne. Listen and, up. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what Wayne yeah. said. So we go into the dressing room and, and, uh, Wayne said, Hey guys, uh, uh, grab a seat. Uh, I've asked Kelly to talk to you about uh, preparing for long overtime. And and so I look around, and I'm standing up in front of everybody, and there's Mark Messier and Mario Lemieux, Lemieux. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Ray Bork, and everybody that's the best player in the game at that point. Yeah. And, and they're like this. They're staring at me like, oh, what's Kelly going to say? We need to listen. Yeah. And it was really cool. And I, I shared with them what my thoughts were. And... Uh, uh, it, it actually is true, and it's statistically been proven. Uh, the first two minutes and the last two minutes of every overtime, uh, most of the goals are scored. Now, yeah. statistically, Chris Snow with the, the Flames, the uh, analytics guy, sent me a text saying it's actually the first three minutes and last three minutes. I always thought it was two minutes, but anyways, my point being the start of the period and the end of the period is when most goals are scored, B- simply because the start, you're not quite mentally ready. You're not, you're still in uh, the rest stage, you know, in the intermission. And the last, because you're, you're getting out of that mindset as well. You're thinking, okay, this is going to the next overtime. I get a little bit of a rest here in a couple minutes. Next thing you know, puck's in the net. So you, you told the guys about that? Yes, I did. Wow. Yes. That's very cool. Yeah. So that, that's such a great leadership moment. And you, you, it was just on the fly, like you Greta pulled you in as you were going to the dressing room. It was just like, um, okay. So I only had like a minute or two to gather some thoughts, right? So I'm sitting on the end of the bench. We're going to walk into the dressing room. And he grabs my arm. And so by the time I'm walking from that point into the dressing room, he settles the guys down. And then I'm talking. It's not like he said to me two days before, (laughs) hey, yeah. Yeah. Get your, gather your thoughts, come yeah. up with something, and in two days, I want you to talk to the guys about this moment. You know, it was like a minute later, maybe, and that's the first thing I thought of, the first two minutes, last two minutes. That's incredible. What, were, you, were you relied upon to be a leader? Did you find that you were a leader in the dressing room and using those kind of, you know, because that's, that's a whole other pressure that you face yeah. is being uh, somebody who stands up and says some things or 
or somebody who's relied upon to provide leadership, whatever that means. Right? Well, um, first of all, I didn't think it was my responsibility. I, I don't think most leaders think that. It just came naturally to me. Yeah. And so I'm not one to um, toot my own horn or anything, but I will tell you this. There were many times in my playing days that uh, a coach would say, Kelly's our captain, our leader. And so <clears throat> it started in junior. Uh, one of my coaches said, Kelly's our captain, basically. Uh, I had no idea what being a leader was. I just, I was pretty honest with guys and I'd share my thoughts about the commitment it would take. Uh, in uh, LA, Barry Melrose is on record saying I was basically the captain. Uh, Daryl Sutter in San Jose said I was the captain. Now, it was interesting, Daryl would say that because he and I didn't have a very good relationship, but yet he thought that of me. But <clears throat> I just thought it was all about uh, saying the right thing at the right time, and I, I didn't force it. I just said what I felt. I was never mean, just honest, and uh, stick up for your teammates. There's a lot in that, though, right? You were you were authentic. You yeah. spoke your mind. You were clear on expectations. Yeah. You were clear on what kind of commitment it took. Yeah. Um, so it's not like you took formal leadership training. Right. But you hear about those things in leaders, like the 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 uh, the best leaders are clear in their expectations yeah. they they speak their mind they're authentic they're steady kind of people mm -hmm. and it's interesting to hear even in LA that they were they said hey you're the captain right yeah it was with that group and Barry only shared that about five six years ago so it's not like when we were playing that I I knew he thought that of me yeah. I had no idea that he thought that I was a leader at all it was it was really cool back when I was playing for the Islanders uh, Al Arbor we had a road game in uh, Edmonton. We stayed over that night, and then the next day we we're going to go to the airport and fly out to another city. And Al asked me not to take the bus uh, with the team that next morning. He had Glenn Hall pick me up. And Glenn Hall, oh my gosh, I mean, one of the most legendary players, not just goalies, but players of all time in the National Hockey League. So Glenn picks me up. He's got this pickup and I'm thinking that's cool Glenn Hall is a pickup and I'm riding in the front seat with him and he's sharing stories and Al just wanted me to be around a, a yeah. great uh, NHL -er and, and learn and I did learn I don't know if Al ever knew this but Glenn shared a whole bunch of stories with me one in particular really stood out he, he said something about you know Kelly why you're here and I said like here in the truck or no in the National Hockey League he said so Here's how it kind of goes. So all of us grew up playing hockey. We're kids. And most part, you move up simply because you're just better yeah. <clears throat> at some age. Sure. And then when it gets to be more competitive, he started talking about junior. He goes, now it's the level that you're at skill-wise, but then the next separation is you care more than the other guys and you're willing to do more. And so you weed out a whole bunch of other guys. And same when you get to the National Hockey League. For the most part, there's not a lot of difference in the talent. But the guys that are the most committed and do the most work on and off the ice seem to rise to a different level. <clears throat> so my point being, the story is that when we were in San Jose, I uh, can't remember my first or last year there, and our team was str struggling. Um, and I thought, you know what? there's something wrong with this group. We're, we're feeling sorry for ourselves. Like I'm, I'm on the bench and I, nobody's standing up at any point in a game. Everybody's head is like this and there's no life. There's no yeah. enthusiasm. Yeah. And so after the game, <clears throat> I said, hey, uh, sit down for a minute. I've got to talk to you here about that. So I shared Glenn's story about, and I could see the guys, like their chest starting to rise. Like he, Kelly's right. Like I'm here because I'm good and I deserve it. And I've, you know, I've left so many people behind that were trying to get to this same level simply because I was willing to do the work. I cared more. Yeah. I played with more spirit and all those sorts of things. And, uh, you know, we weren't a good team back then. So, you know, it's not like we quickly went into first place, but, but our mood changed. And that was important to me. Yeah, and those are the, I mean, in the early days of the San Jose, uh, it's probably important that you just, 
played hard, like to yeah. show the you know this new kind of that's team right. that the, what a hockey was all about. And yeah, yeah, that's very cool. Do you do you take those same leadership skills that you talked about? Authenticity, clear expectations, um, you know, being honest with yourself. Do you take those into your broadcast career because you've been exceptionally uh, successful in, in, in broadcast this whole second career that we haven't even talked yeah, about. Right. Do, you, do you still take those same things? In, into yeah, that I do. Um, it's a, a different thing because, uh, I feel different because it's a different sort of, well, first of all, they're two entirely different jobs, but it, it talking, it's still about hockey, but two entirely different jobs. Yeah. But I think that my approach has always been that just be authentic, just be me. There, there are a lot of people out there um, that uh, speak clearer than I do. They're, they're more polished. They're, you know, all these different things. But I'm real. I go out there, and the one thing I'll say I have going for me, the camera can pick out a liar or a fake, and I'm not a fake. So you can like me or dislike me, can agree with my points, you can disagree, think I'm an idiot, but I just come to work every day and I tell you what I think. So... And that's not going to change. So, you hear a lot. Of, there's so much about leadership authenticity. Like it's very buzzy right now mm -hmm. in HR circles and uh, all organizations in leadership. Um, I struggle with like how do you define it? Like how do mm -hmm. you define being authentic? Uh, but I like the way you laid it down. Right? The, like the the camera is going to pick out a liar, and I'm, I'm going to tell you the does. truth. I'm yeah. going to tell you what I'm feeling and thinking. Uh, do you do you do that? Do you find that you're unfiltered? No, because I am filtered. Um, I'm even more filtered now because it's a different world, right? Yeah. So you've got to yeah, be yeah. very careful. Um, but I'm I'm honest in what I how I assess a player. So that in that sense, I'm unfiltered because when I'm talking about a player, uh, in particular on a Saturday night on hockey night and or any playoff game in a studio, um, I just tell you what I think about a player. Yeah. I tell you what his faults are, uh, what his qualities are, why he's successful, why, why he should maybe add this element or a different element to his game. Yeah. And for that reason, I think that uh, uh, I've got it kind of right. Like I, um, you know, it's a it's a weird job though because you're telling people what you think about somebody, but they could see it entirely differently. Yeah, and that's okay. Of course, it's, it's just totally random to a certain degree. And we look to broadcasters and and especially with Sportsnet and Hockey Night in Canada mm -hmm. and the, I don't want to say monopoly like over over what we think about hockey, but sort of right like yeah. they. What comes from broadcasters and hockey in Canada is it's kind of Bible truth. Yeah. Um, and so if there's multiple perspectives on like how a player's playing or what they're doing or what they're dealing with, right? What Kelly Rudy says that means a lot. Uh, so it's it's interesting to hear that that uh, what you need to do is just bring a veracity and truth to like what you're doing every and day. And I feel that pressure. Yeah. Sure. I do. Uh, that's why I work so hard at my craft. I uh, I think about my job. Uh, all day, every day. A as an example, I find, uh, so today's Tuesday. Wednesday, the Flames are playing at home, so I'm broadcasting that game. But I also, I have Saturday night that I'm thinking about. So I'm trying to do two jobs same day. So yeah. I'm worried about the Flames game, worried about getting uh, all the stories I need for a Calgary Flames, Columbus Blue Jackets game. Yeah. And I'm also thinking of storylines for Saturday, what I need to do to prepare for Saturday. Maybe I can grab something from the Flames game for Saturday. Yep. It's just going round and round and round again. There's that loop. that. Yeah. But in this case, it's not at all debilitating. It's just it's healthy. I have to do that work, and I have to be prepared. If I don't do it, somebody else is doing it. I can tell you that much. There's so many people that would like to sit in my chair. Sure. Uh, and uh, the, there's the preparation. How do you match? Um, uh, this is a to just a purely mm -hmm. selfish question because I, th I think about this a lot. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes the more I am prepared, the less authentic I show up. Like for this, you know, this, mm -hmm. uh, this interaction. Like, yeah. 
if I uh, like, I I definitely prepared. We all oh, prepared. Oh, I can tell. And uh, well, thank you. <laughs> you know a lot and, about uh, me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if I over prepare, though, I, like I don't know if there's such a thing. Hmm. And like maybe I'm not showing up as is authentic, or I'm not in the moment. Mm -hmm. And I I try and stay in the moment. That's kind of like my yeah. thing that I struggle to do because my mind is in a hundred places at once. Right. Right. And. Uh, how do you do that? Like, cause you show up very naturally on screen, mm -hmm. right. And, and, and authentic. And, um, that's one of the reasons why I, th I think you've been so successful. Uh, how do you do that when you're preparing and you match that with just showing up in an authentic, natural kind of way? Yeah. Well, preparation is the, the key for me. Um, so as an example, um, every day I get up, even in the summer, I do about two hours of reading on, hockey just wow. finding all sorts of things no way. some days it yeah. could be a little bit longer in the summer it could be a little bit shorter um, there's always things you can find um, and then number one for me uh, in terms of knowledge about what's happening on the ice I just watch tons of hockey I watch hockey all winter long I I'm really lucky I've been married what coming up 36 years uh, congratulations yes. and my wife likes to watch hockey so uh, we could go to a pub and we'll both watch a hockey game. And yeah. so it, it helps me and uh, all the info. I'll, I'll tell you the, the kind of pressure that you, you can have. So we just finished the trade deadline show. Yeah. So on that panel, um, we're not the news breakers. So that would be Elliot Friedman, Chris Johnson, and Eric Francis. So they break the trades. We, the panel were there to break down the trades. And so if you think about it, because we don't know who's getting traded. Yeah. Any player to any, any team player, for any, any player from any team. So you have to have knowledge yeah. on everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, on that show, you're going to get exposed like nobody's business. Yeah. So I was thinking about it that day. Like, that's pretty cool. All of us on that panel, you can ask us our opinion on any player. Yeah. You may not agree with the opinion, but we will tell you what we think of that particular player, yeah. what his strengths are. Um, and we're not talking stars. We're no. talking like fourth liners, guys who are played at, had a cup of tea in the, in the league. Nick Ritchie AHL. from Anaheim yeah. going to Boston. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. I'll, I, in fact, he was the one guy I was a little bit hard on because uh, I think there's a lot of areas that he can improve his game. Yeah. And so... Uh, if you're just a casual fan, you, you might be going, well, how would they know that? Yeah. Or, but, uh, you know, the other good thing is because of my job with the Flames, I see a lot of teams, right? Yeah. So, and sure. I, I make mental notes on every single player all game yeah. long. That's what I do. And so not only am I calling the game and telling the fans back home what just happened and uh, why things happened, uh, I'm making notes in my own head about that player – or the third line right winger on a team and uh, what his strengths are. So that's how my brain works. I just, I don't really have to make notes. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I'm lucky it I can there. retain it. Oh, poor you. You just have this <laughs> vault like memory. That would have helped me in medical school. <laughs> Jesus. That's very cool. Do you, we were talking about these leadership skills and, yeah. and the, the other part of, your life is use your family yeah, and uh, bringing an authenticity and clear expectations. I think those apply to being a good father. Yeah. Uh, have you, have you tried to apply those in, in your family life in particular when you have uh, a daughter uh, who, you know, has come to you with OCD and, and mm -hmm. you, and you've worked through all this. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you apply those skills there? Well, it's just what you were, we were talking about just being honest and uh, helpful, supportive, um, in terms of like uh, Caitlin and I and our family, um, my wife Donna, she's uh, as supportive, if not more, than I am with uh, uh, Kate and our other two daughters. Uh, Donna just doesn't want want to be the voice. She likes to be supportive, and we do uh, lots of uh, public speaking events, plenty. Yeah. And so Donna is always there. She's supportive. She likes to sit close by, and and she'll add the odd comment, but. Um, when Caitlin and I go speak publicly, we're just really honest about what we've gone through. So it's very emotional, and 
I don't mind. Like I'm a crier anyways. Like I cry at weddings. I'm, I'm that kind of guy that I, I cry when I'm happy and cry when I'm uh, sad. So, but we share all that and, uh, I'm not ashamed of that. I, I think that it's just the, the journey we've been on and it's hard. It's really hard and didn't like a lot of it. Did you, you, you've talked about some lessons that you've learned along the way, like, uh, and I, I think those strategies and the advocacy is important for, you know, the, the folks who listen to this show. Um, what have you learned along the way in terms of how you can help as a parent? Uh, you've got to be a really good listener and understand what the person's going through. And uh, oftentimes uh, there's no answer. Like, you, there's, they can tell you what they're going through and there's no answer that you can turn it around for them. They're just, there's lots of work that we, uh, we have to do together and you've got to put in the time and we've got to be there, we've got to be patient. Like some of the uh, best work we've ever done and my favorite work between Kate and I, and Donna's done it as well, of course, but for whatever reason, Caitlin and I uh, were really good at breathing together. In, when she was really young and she really had to breathe a lot and you as a doctor know the importance of that and how long those breathing sessions can be so I might even be on the road and Kate will call and say tell me what's going on uh, I would ask her what level she's at so I know what might be in front of us in yep. terms of breathing and the severity of uh, what she's going through and so if she would give me a high number, like an eight or a nine or a 10, then I know that this breathing session, once I can get her to a breathing session, yeah. because she still has all these irrational thoughts. And so once we start the breathing session, that could take uh, three hours on the phone. So, you know, you've got to get that breathing, control the breathing, do the uh, in and out and slow breaths. And then over time, you find out where she might be, she might be down to a nine now, might over time get her down to a seven. And then for Caitlin, um, she wa needed to get to her happy place, which is her garden. So it would be in her head, it was our backyard, but the garden was a really bleak place when she was there at the beginning, just dark. And then over time, when you're breathing, then she starts to see some color, might see some flowers, some grass, green grass, or dogs, those sorts of things. So those sessions, uh, I'll never forget, right? Like, hmm. Yeah, it's quite powerful. You, you were, well, what's, what's so striking to me is, uh, is how present you were for your daughter, like three hours on the hmm. phone. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really cool to hear but for a number of reasons. The, the one thing that jumps out to me is, uh, you know, how successful you've been in this career and you've been such a present, caring, loving father. So that's not easy to do. You know, it's a ton of work. It's a ton of emotion. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's just really cool to hear how you, you know, have I traveled had, along that journey. Brian, I had, uh, my wife and I both share the same story in that we were uh, lucky because we both had really great parents as well. So that's what we learned. Yeah. That's what we saw. So, and I'm not uh, being dismissive to anybody out there that didn't have that sort of upbringing. Um, I'm not being rude. I'm just saying our experiences were really positive. So when our kids ran into problems, then we were like, okay, take a, a real measured, calm approach to it. And what do we need to do to help? Can we help? Maybe you can't. Yeah. The thing that I was struck by parenting is like my parents never complained <laughs> yeah. one time about like, my dad driving me three hours to a hockey game same or piano practice every thursday for a decade like yeah. they just never said one word about it that was complaining and um and then you get on the other side of it and you worry mm. like the stress and the worry about just it's always it's always there right you know i had the, to that point you know you were lucky i was lucky my wife donna was lucky i think my kids would tell you that they've had a good experience with the yeah. uh, uh, us as parents, but oftentimes when we're on the road um, in my playing days, I'd go up to a guy, whether it's on the plane or on the bus going to another airport, and I'd say, well, what's your story? How'd you grow up? What, what's your story? How'd you get here? Mm -hmm. And uh, I tell you one time, I had a guy 
Uh, I won't tell you what team, what position, none of that. Protect his identity, but it was sad. Like he told me, uh, his dad was really tough on him. Yeah. So, yeah. If the if the dad would go to the, the son's game, but if the dad didn't think his son played well enough, he wouldn't give him a ride home after a game. Wow. So the kid was embarrassed. He was shocked. So wow. he'd either have to ask a teammate uh, if his parents could drive him home, hmm. and or oftentimes out of embarrassment because. He didn't want to go because, well, your dad's here. How come he's not giving you a ride? So yeah. he, he couldn't share that. He was a kid, right? He's yeah. a teenager. So he'd take the bus home or he'd, if the rink was close to his house, he'd just carry his, uh, his equipment home. It was so sad. And, he, like, he teared up. He was, like, yeah. crushed. Yeah. And I'm thinking, first of all, how in the world did you get here? Like, because it's hard to get to the National Hockey League, and you've got to be, you know, you've got to have a lot yeah. of good things. You've got to have a lot of positive things happening in your life and uh, what a battle it's kind of like our good friend Clint Malarchuk how in the world did he ever last with yeah like I've known Clint since uh, we we're about 11 years old 10 years old grew up in the same neighborhood and I read his book and his book was so moving and powerful and honest I remember I was on an airplane um, and I'm reading the book I had to close it because I was tearing up hmm. yeah we had uh, Sheldon Kennedy on the show a couple of weeks ago. He's and, awesome. Um, yeah, and another exceptional individual who uh, dealt with so much yeah. adversity and came out on the on the other end of it, and uh, and you just kind of ask yourself how, how you know how did you do it right? Because right? I, I, you know, I also have been blessed with very good parents and yeah. a structured environment and loving, caring, right? And. Uh, yeah, it's it's tough to imagine how you could achieve the heights that he has, I know. and 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 without that kind of structure and all that pain that he is going yeah. through. Holy, he's a he's a special person though. Sheldon Theo Fleury is doing the same great work. No There's doubt. so many people out there yeah. that have uh, been they've gone through horrific things, and they're they're leaders in our community, yeah. and and they're teaching us so much. Well, Kelly, I really appreciate your leadership in this space, your mental health advocacy. Uh, you know, I learned so much about leadership today and some of the awesome mm. stories that you shared. So thank you so much for for the authenticity that you bring every night when we're watching you on TV and uh, for everything that you do for those who are advocating for mental health in our community. And uh, finally, thanks for being on the show today. Thanks, Ryan. I'd love to be a guest some point down the road. If you, you we'll ever have, want we'll to have you back. Okay. We'll have you back. It's awesome. Thank <laughs> you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, so thank you listeners for joining us today. Uh, again, my name is Dr. Ryan Todd, and this is Beyond the Checkbox. And uh, we had a very esteemed and special guest, Kelly Rudy, today, who is, uh, we we're very fortunate for him to join us. So thank you for being on the show today, Kelly. Thank you.